Dodgers. It's good to be here again. Do you like this picture? Is it awesome? <laughs> so this is a picture uh, I took yesterday in southern France where I went hiking with, uh, with a bunch of friends and we climbed this mountain and like this is what I saw and it just totally blew my mind. So I took a picture of it and when I was later looking at my, through my photos, I realized this is a perfect picture for my talk about being open-minded, um, you know, scenery of something that totally blew my mind. So, thanks for having me here. It's a big honor. This is the second time I'm in Dodge.js. I came here in 2012. And I came just as a software engineer, uh, working at Google as a lead on AngularJS project and uh, open source contributor. I was sitting in the audience and watching lots of talks. And the talk that made the biggest impression on me was the talk of this crazy guy, Fat. And uh, he talked about open source, about the history, about some good stuff about open source and struggles. And I strongly encourage you, if you uh, are an open source contributor, if you use open source uh, software, or if you lead an open source project, check out the talk. It's probably the most thought-provoking talk about open source software that I've ever seen. So after this talk, I was starting thinking, like, if I ever come back to .js and stand here on this stage like I do right now, um, what would be the one thing that I would talk about uh, and share with the audience like, like you guys? And I came to conclusion after a lot of thinking that there is this attitude that I aspire to apply to my life and to my work, and that's to being open-minded about things. So my goal today is going to be to convince you that keeping your mind open is a good thing. And um, I'll show you some examples of how you can apply it to software development. So I assume that most of here uh, are software engineers, software developers, or somehow related to, to software development. And often, the way I describe software engineering is that it's a healthy mix of science and art. Science because we want to build something that is functional, something that works really well, something that is performant, uh, that doesn't have big flaws hopefully, uh, but also is a piece of art, something that users feel great about using uh, when they interact with the application, but not only about you know, the user experience, but also what the code feels like when you look at it, when you work with it. You know, is it something that you like? Is it something that you feel great about, that you are proud of? Um, and I would say that most of us feel very strongly about our code and want to make it beautiful. And this is not the only thing that we share with artists, because if you look at the history of, of famous artists, you'll notice that one of the things that they do is they look at the arts and the, the products of um, masters of um, the art of the time. They analyze these other arts. They analyze the work of other artists. And uh, they learn from that. They, they get inspiration. And then they apply it to their work. And eventually, uh, they will be the ones inspiring the next generation of artists. And if you look at the open source development, this is exactly what is happening there. You know, we look at different projects, we try to see, you know, how was something built, what can I learn about that, how can I uh, apply that to my project, or how can I avoid some, some issues that happened in an open source project. So let's take a look at Angular, because what I'm going to talk about is how we can apply this, this attitude of being open-minded to software development. And the backstory for that that I'm going to use is, is talk about how we build Angular and how we try to apply this kind of attitude to, to the software development and the development of Angular. And along the way, I'm going to give you some behind-the-scenes information that is typically not available um, because people you know, look at the APIs, but they don't understand how that API evolved, how it came to be, and what kind of people were involved in making the decision about that. So Angular 1. Uh, we launched it in 2012 uh, after three years of development, and it was a framework that we built um, for the web of 2012. Um, and that web was very different from the one that we have today. It was a web when jQuery was the king and Ajax was a thing. Um, and kind of what surprised us was how successful Angular was. Not because we didn't believe it, but because we didn't expect such an enthusiastic response from the, the web ecosystem. And we saw lots of projects either use Angular, build on top of Angular, or get inspired uh, by many of the things that we did in Angular. So it was clear to us that there is a lot we can do to evolve Angular. But about a year into 
you know, Angular totally taking off, we started thinking, you know, what would it take to, to build the next generation of a framework? Like, what kind of thinking or how would we do that? And uh, we had a lot of experience. We had a lot of adventure just because we learned a lot from Angular 1. So we saw things that work. We saw things that didn't work and could apply that to, uh, to the next generation of the framework. Um, additionally, we also saw that the expectations of the users were changing. The web was changing. Uh, the users expected much more richer applications with more functionality. These applications typically require more code uh, to be written, and you have more developers uh, working on the team to build these applications. So we started thinking about you know, how to build software or how to build a framework that would allow building applications that are more performant, that are more scalable. And also, one thing that we started seeing was this tectonic shift that was about to happen on the web. Um, and to give you a good example of that, it's ES6. Like, ES6 in 2000, 2013, it was still a pipe dream. It wasn't cl quite clear when it's going to be finished, what's going to be part of the spec. But there were things that we really liked. We liked classes because it allowed us to express many things that we commonly did on a ba daily basis in a much better way. We liked the module system that allowed us to scale our projects much better, make them more modular. And we also liked a lot of the syntactic sugar that came uh, with, with ES6, like fat arrows. And again, this comes back to the artistry. Like, we want a code to be look beautiful uh, for us to be easy to read it. And syntactic sugar helps quite a bit with that. So the one decision that we made early on was that we really want to take advantage of ES6 and make it the first class citizen in this next generation of the framework. We still want to support ES5, but that's a secondary target for us. The next thing that we saw was web components. And they were taking off. They were becoming a real thing after years of spec development. And as we started looking into web components, we realized that we faced this existential question. And funny enough, it was the same question that Shakespeare Hamlet faced uh, a couple of years ago. <laughs> it was, to be or not to be dumb? <laughs> that is the question. And what I mean by this, uh, we needed to decide whether DOM was going to be the fundamental fabric of the framework, whether the components and the composition of the, uh, of the, the components was going to be expressed, expressed through DOM, or if DOM was just going to be a rendering target for us, something that our custom data structures will output uh, at the end so that uh, the UI is updated. So we did a lot of research, we did a lot of prototyping, we did a lot of uh, talking to various people, and we realized that there were many things that we liked about web components. We liked the interoperability, we liked the composition model, we liked the encapsulation, and we were totally sold on bringing this to, to Angular. There were other things like um, web components, the, the, the public API surface of custom elements really comes down to two things. It comes to properties and events. And we liked the simplicity and decided that we must support web components in this next generation of the, the web framework. And this kind of put very strict constraints on the template and syntax that we could use. Um, so we came up with a proposal, shared it with the community. Everybody hated it <laughs> because it was different. It was very different. And we kind of struggled with explaining you know, why, why does it have to be this way. We tried to tell people you know, web components are coming. We want to make uh, Angular work with them. And because of that, we need to work with these constraints. But it's easy to argue and you know, throw proposals at us. So we, we looked at a lot of counterproposals um, and eventually basically rejected all of them and decided to go with our own plan. And I know that I'm talking about being open-minded, <laughs> but one thing I want you to know is that open-minded is not about um, accepting all the ideas that come from outside. Open-minded means that you should be able to accept ideas, evaluate them, and then decide on your own whether those ideas are something that you want to take advantage of or not. So uh, sometimes this requires some tough calls, and, and this was the case. The good thing is that after every, the dust settled, uh, now everybody's OK with the new syntax because it's not so foreign anymore. Um, and that's a good thing. The last thing about web components is that we finally answered the question about um, for, for Hamlet um, and decided that that DOM is just going to be a rendering target. And the reason for this was that being 
And DOM being just a rendering target gave us more flexibility in terms of performance optimizations that we could do and um, applicability of framework like running on the server and many other things. So we felt more freedom and more opportunities with treating DOM as a rendering target rather than as, as something that is tightly coupled with the framework. The next source of inspiration and ideas came from a very unusual place. Um, many people see React and Angular as like two enemies that are fighting this bloody battle on the fields of open source every day. But the reality is that that's not the case at all. Like, we have pretty good relationships with the React team. We meet them um, occasionally, uh, several times a year. We discuss ideas, we share experiences, see what works, what doesn't. We have really good ex uh, relationships uh, in this way. We try to help each other whenever it makes sense. Um, and I have to say that one of the things that surprised us or inspired us was the unidirectional data flow. Um, because this is an idea that I think, in my personal opinion, is the biggest contribution React made to the, the web ecosystem. Because they, they have proven that this different kind of um, data update propagation model is something that scales and is, and is uh, possible to use in big applications. And for us, when we looked at this, we realized that this kind of model of updates uh, was solving exactly the same problems we struggled with uh, in our mission-critical applications at Google uh, that were built with Angular. And um, because of that, we rejected the alternative model, uh, which was Object Observe, which is something we favored for years and thought that this is going to be the big thing. But um, we were wrong. And uh, the right thing there is to you know, accept the idea that is superior. And that's what we did. Um, around this time, we started talking to two crazy guys uh, from Netflix, Ben Lesh and Jafar Hussain. And if you know them, you know that they're super passionate about observables and RxJS. And we talked to them, and you know, they were all talking about observables, and we're like, these guys are using some drugs or something. I don't know <laughs> what's going on here. But eventually, we looked, we looked into observables. And one thing we realized is that observables are this very powerful async primitive much, much more powerful than Promises. And you know, honestly, I was the one who, who found Promises in, and implemented in, in Angular five years ago or, or so, uh, before Promises were a big thing in, in the web community. And at the time, I was really excited about them. But then when I looked at observables, I felt the same feeling, like this is going to be the next big thing. And the reason for that is that observables have many features that promises don't. They, pr they support uh, cancellation in a very natural way. The composition works better. Um, they have these powerful operators that you can reuse. It's like Lodash for your async programming. It's, it's pretty crazy what you can do with observables. Um, and lastly, observables form this natural, natural way to functional programming and reactive programming that is becoming mainstream these days. So we adopted observables in a big way, and when you build Angular 2 applications, you actually use observables quite a bit uh, in your application. Um, this is also a controversial one. Uh, <laughs> when I talk to people, um, they are often baffled by the fact that this crazy team from Google is working with this other team from Microsoft, the TypeScript team. And they're like, how can that be? You know, how is this possible, Google and Microsoft? Uh, and honestly, like, what happened was that after we announced Angular 2, we said that we want these kind of extensions to the JavaScript uh, language, that we would go to TC39 and work with TC39. And TypeScript guys came to us and were like, hey, we're going to implement all this stuff for you and work with you to get this stuff into the standard. Uh, would you be interested in that? And we're like, what do you want from us? Uh, this is <laughs> suspicious. <laughs> but over time, um, they really earned our trust. And we realized that they were awesome guys, you know, very sharp engineers. And we created this symbiotic relationship where Angular is helping TypeScript, but TypeScript is helping Angular. Um, Having said that, TypeScript is not the only way to build Angular 2 applications. You can still use ES5 or ES6, but there is like so much more you can do with TypeScript. For example, you can get error checking through the type system uh, that they have. You can get automatic refactoring, which is very important as your code base uh, grows. Um, you get better ID support with auto-completion, inline documentation, and that kind of stuff. And lastly, because TypeScript is just a superset of JavaScript, um, you get really seamless JavaScript interoperability. 
And this is very important uh, to us because we want as much of the existing ecosystem to work with Angular. Um, so JavaScript interop, super important. As we started using tools more and more often, um, we realized that getting started with Angular was becoming difficult. And we didn't want this kind of tooling to get in the way of, of uh, development um, of Angular applications. So we started thinking of building a CLI that would help you just generate the project, set up the build system, and that kind of stuff. And these interesting guys came along, and they were like, hey, we could help you, because we have quite a bit of experience. So Ember CLI has been doing CLI for many years before we even started thinking about it seriously. And if you know anything about the relationship between Ember and Angular, uh, you know that during the days of Angular 1, the Ember community was super critical about Angular. Uh, to the point where, uh, let's not go there. <laughs> but it was really amazing to see this community grow and mature and uh, become constructive partner in the web ecosystem to the point where when we needed CLI, they were willing to help us. And we really appreciated that. So we started working on the CLI. We, we liked the, the tools integration. We, we got this with this. Uh, we liked the conventions uh, because that allows you to scale your project and apply it uh, across bigger development teams. And just general productivity gains were great. And to this day, uh, we are still using a lot of the Ember CLI code in, in CLI. So a CLI, if you are interested, you can check it out. Uh, it's still in beta, but even today, it's probably the best way to start Angular 2 projects. Um, so as we were building more and more of the framework, we started building more and more applications. And we realized that it's very important that whatever the framework does, it's compatible with mobile use cases. Um, and mobile really brings different kinds of constraints to web development than desktop uh, web. One of the interesting ones is uh, low memory. Well, many of the devices, especially the low-end ones, they, they don't have as much memory as a typical desktop uh, machine. So thinking about reducing the garbage collection becomes very critical. And this is something that we did in the core of the framework. Um, additionally, the low-end devices often don't have um, very strong CPUs. So whatever code we write or we generate for you needs to be super efficient. Uh, and again, this is something that was a big consideration in the design of the framework. And lastly, because of the network uh, speed and latency and flakiness, it becomes really important to reduce the payload size and enable code splitting for your applications so that you can do lazy loading. Um, our solution to this was the design of Angular, uh, which involves code generation. The way that works is we analyze an application, uh, we read all of the metadata, we read everything that is declarative, analyze it, try to understand as much as we can about the application. We try to understand the composition model, all of the data bindings that you have in the application, um, pretty much uh, uh, everything that is uh, statically analyzable we extract and use in one way or another. And using that information, we generate code. Uh, where the goal, our goal is to compile the framework away. So that at the end of the day, uh, once your application runs, all you have is your code and code that we generated specifically for your application based on the needs of your application. Um, and while we can do this in the browser, it's even more important that we can do it as a build step. We call this compilation ahead of time compilation. Um, because it means that we can run it uh, on the server, we can run it during, um, before the deployment of production. Um, and some of the big benefits of this is that uh, we can significantly reduce the payload size, uh, because the compiler, which is the biggest chunk of, of Angular 2 right now, just goes away. You don't need to deal with it. Um, we also speed up the bootstrap process, because the analysis, the code generation, they take some time. Um, we don't want to do it when the user is waiting for the UI to render. Um, you can do it on the server. You can do it before deployment. And then when it comes to start the application, all we are doing is just rendering. So that's, that's super cool. And the last thing is error checking. Because we understand so much about the application, we can catch errors. We can catch bugs and tell you, hey, your data binding, you know, you're binding to a thing that doesn't exist. Or here, using using component that is not known to us, um, you probably made a mistake. Um, and this helps overall productivity. We can um, surface these errors through IDEs. So as you write your code, we can already tell you, hey, this is not going to work. You should probably look into it more and, and fix it up. I couldn't do a talk about Angular without mentioning our community, because our community is just amazing. And unlike with Angular 1, where the community was relatively small, um, Angular 2 had a huge community 
watching, which is both good and bad, you know, like imagine a couple thousand or maybe uh, tens of thousands of people watching over your shoulder as you write this code. It's an it's interesting feeling and an interesting sense of responsibility. Um, but the, the good thing was that the, the community prepared the ecosystem for Angular too. They, they started writing books, tutorials, they started working on integrations. We have uh, Ionic integration already, we have Onsen, uh, we have a native script integration. Um, and all of this was happening as we were still building the framework. So all these people working on this material were able to feed us with things that worked or that didn't work, and we still had a chance to tweak things and, and adjust things. And this made the overall product much better. Um, of course, as I mentioned, there was uh, some controversies about certain decisions, but you know, that's life. <laughs> um, finally, in, in mid-September, we launched Angular 2. And for me, the, the launch was this tribute to not only the Angular team that worked super hard to like, combine all of these idea ideas and make them work together, but a tribute to the whole web ecosystem, because you know, it was people like you who write blog posts uh, that constructively share your ideas, that write um, demos and talks and, and create libraries that we see on the web, and then that gets us thinking about, you know, maybe we could take this and that and put it to Angular, and it was really the whole web ecosystem that made uh, Angular 2 better. So hopefully, you know, Providing all this evidence about um, you know, unexpected friends that helped us uh, from um, companies that people would not expect, or, or um, like in the case of Ember, a uh, community that at first was you know, not very nice to, to the Angular community, and then they, they turned around and became uh, really supportive. Um, if you keep your mind open, like, you get all these benefits, and you are able to evaluate ideas and incorporate them into your project. Um, and I really hope that you, know, you will leave this conference thinking more about how you can be more receptive to ideas, how can you evaluate them, and how can you incorporate them to your products or to your life to make it, to make it better. With that, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the conference. <laughs>